Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's program in the Horn of Africa TV Youth Program. This is Nawaya Skerum, and I'm joined by my co-host, Ms. Kana Johannes. Uh, and we are also joined by uh, an Eritrean journalist and activist comrade, L.S. Amara. And we'll be discussing about TPLF and its relationship with EPLF and Eritrea in general since its inception in 1975. Thank you for joining us, L.S. Amara. Welcome. Thank you for having me, uh, Bai and Ms. Ghana. It's a pleasure, always a pleasure to talk to the youths. And I'm always inspired to talk to you. And I'm glad we're having this conversation. Thank you. So I'll pass it on to Ms. Ghana. Ms. Ghana, you can go ahead. Nice having you, Mr. Elias. Um, as so uh, my colleague said about what the topic is going to be, uh, we have prepared several questions for today. And um, we begin with the first one, that is, uh, what does the TPLF stands for? Who the TPLF uh, is to begin with? Okay, good question. So we will begin from the very beginning. This is an important topic, I think, uh, for the Eritrean youth growing up in the diaspora, uh, the Ethiopian audience, the international audience, because the nature of the TPLF uh, has not been dealt exhaustively uh, in English. We've been dealing with it in Tigrinya here on, in the Horn of Africa TV, for example. Uh, viewers can refer to uh, my previous interview with uh, Rodas Abraham, for example, in Tigrinya. We, we dealt with it in three parts uh, exhaustively, but this is a chance to deal with it with the TPLF and its relationship with the EPLF and Eritrea in general. Over the past 46 years, since its inception, its beginning, very beginning in 1975. So what does the TPLF stand for? Uh, what is the acronym? What does it stand for? Well, it stands for the Tigray People's Liberation Front. That was that is the name that it finally assumed. But in the beginning, it was not named as such. In Tigrinya, the its name that it's known for now is his Bawi Wayani Harnat Tigray. I think it assumed that name in 1979. In the beginning. The very first group that formed it uh, were young students, uh, most of them from Addis Ababa University. So they gathered uh, to form a group called Mahber Gasgasti Tigray, huh? which in English would be roughly translated as the Association of Tigrayan Ethnic uh, Progressives or Ethnic Tigrayan Progressives. Mahabar Gasgasti Bihere Tigrayati, or Magept is the acronym in Tigrinya. Well, so as soon as they formed this uh, group, uh, they moved to the rural areas of Tigray, and there uh, they connect with other uh, people who have already started the armed struggle. And they, uh, the name then was Tigadlo uh, Harnet Hizbi Tigray, which in, in Tigrinya is different from what it assumed later, Hizbawi Wayani Harnet Tigray. But we can say that it's, uh, it's what became the TPLF letter. Uh, now, uh, the first contacts were with the EPLF with the Eritrean People's Liberation Front. Uh, at that time in 1975, it was forces rather than front, Eritrean People's Liberation Forces, which later became in 1977, after its first Congress, the Eritrean People's Liberation Front. The acronym though is the same, EPLF. Now the EPLF had already uh, split then from the Eritrean Liberation Front which started the armed struggle in 1961. Uh, progressives, radicals who wanted to correct the, the 
uh, sectarian line and form a progressive organization. Uh, so eventually they coalesced in what is what was known as the Eritrean People's Liberation Forces. Now, uh, the EPLF had already established relations with another uh, the democratic progressive Ethiopian uh, organization, which later became the EPRP, the Ethiopian People's Revolutionary Party. Uh, this relationship started in 1972, but contacts were uh, established prior to that in, in Addis Ababa, in the campus of Addis Ababa University. Mm, you have to bear in mind that the late 1960s and early 1970s in Ethiopia, in particular at Addis Ababa University, were a period of ferment, of radicalization of students, university students. Huh? Uh, and so both Ethiopian uh, and Eritrean students studying together were debating on how to bring about change, uh, the downfall of the, you know, the, the, the monarchy of Haile Selassie, uh, issues of uh, national issues were debated in, in Addis Ababa University, uh, leaders, of the students' union, such as Walele Mokon and, and Tolahun Gizau, these are Ethiopian radical uh, students' uh, leaders, uh, were raising the questions of nationality in Ethiopia. Um, and in the early 70s, or of course, uh, there were hijackings of uh, Ethiopian Airlines planes. Uh, some groups had already hijacked uh, an Ethiopian Airlines plane and were in Khartoum, then later they migrated uh, to Algeria. Uh, in Europe and in, in the United States, there are also uh, students' union, uh, students' movements. Uh, uh, the one in, in Europe led by Haile Fida uh, later became the Meison or All Ethiopian Socialist uh, Movement. Its acronym in Amharic was MEISO. Uh, in, in the United States, there was a group called IZUNA. I'm bringing this to, to give you a background. Huh? So by 1972 also, uh, since the EPLF had split from the ELF and had established its stronghold in the Sahel Mountains of Northern Eritrea, a group uh, of Ethiopians came by way of uh, Somalia uh, and South Yemen, Aden, eventually ended up in, in Eritrea uh, and joined the EPLF. So this was a small group, but later others joined it, such as one of the founders of the EPRP, Berhanemesk al Radda, came and joined them. And within EPLF, they formed one, maybe, uh, you know, a company, and they stayed there for almost two years, uh, received training. Uh, a recent interview by one of that uh, group, for example, his name is uh, uh, Abiyu Brille. He, he has written a book in, in Amharic, a, a very big book is projected to be a, uh, the first volume of uh, a series. Maybe the, the second volume will be coming soon. But uh, a year ago, his first book was Yager uh, Fikr Guzo in Amharic. So he had conducted even interviews in Ethiopian television about his experience and his group's experience with the EPLF. He, he recalls that, that period fondly. We <laughs> led by Isaiah Safarki in Sahel by way of Aden, South Yemen, in September of 1972. 
Later, Brahana Mascarada joined us. All in all, I stayed in the struggle with the EPLF with my Ethiopian comrades in Eritrea for almost three years, certainly over two years and a half, until February 1975, when we left to continue the struggle inside Ethiopia in Asimba Tigray. Isaias received us warmly and assured us they would give the Ethiopian struggle all the support we needed. We had a good camaraderie relations and Isaias didn't have any special privileges or guards. The life of the combatants was egalitarian. I was trained as a medic there. I fought in many battles alongside the Eritrean comrades and I remember many Eritrean comrades with whom I fought side by side who fell in battle. I have fond memories of my time with the APLF in Eritrea. I have not seen Isaias in over 40 years and I would like to visit Eritrea and meet with him. ስለዚህ <laughs> I think Bundo Shagal. Lemon, it's Ramnaf. But Russia, we did track a boy, you ever had a muscle button car. Take an unnatural. When I told me, the son of never had a muscle button, the simata, the Tazilicon, any hegeta calacal sibal bazu, the Nalazes of good. He a French girl, Gri Buzutigal with our Dalco, Gamu Yalloin. Do the Tarka Patilic would go to the Satwa. Italy and the Gamisayas, the Bessalian South. Look, and then you have Italy, he grat only me by a command suga, the Lays of good, so Tamka Baruganab. Near Scout the German, I'll let Kazan. You have Zuchin here to Mahalim Yagalam, I came Slenaber. Yeah, Angry Addis Bahal Namihono, never telling the Eternal Garbuzu, the Eras in Nagar, but I'm Kerrovna Baring, Kerran at Guard doing a check. Buzuchi Grust Aurans Lassal of Kedemendal could ornate me on Barahabum on Bamasalona. Then out at Ning, you know, Hahulatas was Taka, Vidmina Lothianina. Ahun Liknasun, ye the Mot Ornatna Barenaka with Zilingana. The connection with the Galicia-Chot-Yachot-Hitquins relationship with Ethiopian groups did not start with, with the Tigrayan People's Liberation Front, but it preceded it by two or three years with, with groups that later became uh, uh, the EPRP, the Ethiopian People's Revolutionary Party. Uh, this group stayed in, in Eritrea, struggled alongside the EPLF, received training, uh, fought uh, battles alongside Eritreans, Several of their uh, comrades were martyred alongside Eritrean uh, groups. Later, they moved to, to what is 
now uh, Tigray in, in the part of uh, Tigray called Asimba, uh, the mountains there, and formed the base of the EPRP. Uh, so by the time the first contingent of Tigrayans came to receive training in 1975 from the EPLF, uh, there were already another group that that had fought alongside the EPLF and had established its base in Asimba called EPRP. This is very important to note. So the first group comes to, to receive training in, uh, in Eritrea. And this part is uh, narrated very well in uh, the book that was edited by Tesfaye Gavrab called Terarau Yankatekatao Tulid the generation that, that shook the mountains. Uh, it's in Amharic, uh, the first volume. Uh, he, uh, Tesfaye Gavrab was one of the editors. Uh, there's a chapter there that gives the detailed account of this uh, first uh, period of who came to Eritrea. Uh, so, you know, many of uh, those who later became the leaders of the TPLF received their first training in that period. Incidentally, uh, the, the former prime minister, the late prime minister, Merles Zenawi, was supposed to come uh, to receive his training with this group, but for uh, uh, reasons that are murky, he did not go with them. He remained in Asmara and uh, did not receive training and uh, later uh, joined them after the first contingent received their training in, in, in Eritrea with the EPLF. So from this beginning then, uh, the EPLF uh, trained them, armed them, and uh, uh, later this relationship grew. Uh, there were ups and downs in, in the relationship we will, which we will deal with uh, you know, uh, in subsequent uh, parts of this uh, of this conversation, but uh, by 1976, this group uh, had uh, a conference in which it issued uh, the manifesto of uh, 1976, the manifesto of TPLF. Uh, in this manifesto, they tried to clarify who is Tigrayan, and in this issue, they say all those in Tigray from uh, the Tigrayan ethnicity, T uh, Tegaru, uh, Afar, uh, Kunama, Irob, or Saho speaking uh, Tig Tigrayans, all these are uh, Tigrayans, they, 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 they say in that manifesto. And they, they also uh, came up uh, with a map of Tigray, uh, what became known later as the Greater Tigray. They said the borders of Tigray are uh, from the south, the Aloha River of Wolo, which included large chunks of Raya uh, and the former uh, province of Wolo of Ethiopia. Uh, to the west, they, they claim that Wolkai and Tegede are also in Tigray. Mm, to the north, they claim uh, areas of Bademe and the Mereb Gash uh, River is the border of Tigray, they claim. Sorona, they included in, in Tigray at that time. And so they had this grand, uh, grand vision of greater Tigray. And by the way, in the Bada area also, they claim that Tigray had access to, to the sea. Manifesto of the Tigray People's Liberation Front, TPLF, Volume 1, February 1976. <laughs> This is the manifesto of the Tigray People's Liberation Front, TPLF, which is the genuine representative of the Tigrayans. Tigrayans are all people's citizens living in Tigray and outside the territory. 
that is the Highland, the Greenland speaking, the Afar, Teltal, Ago, Saho, Kunama, etc. Its territory lies between Aloha in the south and Marib in the north, including Wakai, the Tsalanti in the west. Tigray was known as the Aksuma Kingdom until the ruin of this kingdom. Later in 19th century, during the reign of Johannes IV, Tigray gained power and expanded its rule to other kingdoms. But after the death of Johannes IV, it fell to Shoan hegemony under Menenik II. Thereafter, its autonomy and independence was lost and fell under the centralized rule of Shua. Parts of its territory were torn away from it to destroy the unity of its people to starve them and to speed up the Amara acculturation of its people. The target of the Tigrayan national struggle is and should be of necessity be mainly against Amara national subjugation. Hence, the first task of this national struggle will be the establishment of an independent democratic republic of Tigray. Politically, TPLF fights for the establishment of an independent Tigray with a democratic republic state. As soon as this map and uh, TPLF manifesto of uh, Greater Tigray was issued, it faced uh, tremendous pushback and criticism from Eritrean uh, uh, movements, as well as from progressive Ethiopian movements. So this backlash and criticism uh, was so much that they withdrew this manifesto and just uh, claimed that uh, they are struggling for, uh, in general terms, uh, what they called the self-determination of the people of Tigray which may include up to secession. But in the initial manifesto, they declare that their objective was to struggle for an independent democratic republic of Tigray. That is, secession was their objective. But this, uh, uh, this objective of secessionist uh, you know, uh, goal of establishing a, an independent republic of Tigray was there throughout the past 46 years, uh, on and off. Sometimes they would hide this, they would put it in the shelf or hide it under the table, but other times they would bring it to the fore. So uh, this uh, very opportunistic, chameleon-like uh, uh, objectives uh, were always there in, in the TPLF's uh, uh, struggle, I mean, the TPLF's existence of the past 46 years. So for that still is a puzzle. The problem to me is this is a very small group. When it was created in 1975, it never had any agenda for Ethiopia at all. Never. We had to go through a struggle of about five or ten years to convince these people that there is nothing like independence of Tigray. Tigray as a region could not be independent. One can have his own grandiose ideas about his own territory, his own particular region, but that was not realistic. And we had to finally arrive at a point where we convinced them that this is not tenable. They shifted and, well, then again, they were more internationalistic than our uh, uh, perceived uh, uh, understanding of their policies. Well, no, no problem. We lived with that. We lived with a number of other things. We wanted to see Ethiopia allow its populations to participate in what actually uh, means a new Ethiopia. 1991 came, Mengistu was ousted. Was, was These people began redrawing borders. Yes, within the context of federal Ethiopia and the federal constitution, they had the full right, the ultimate right, and probably the supreme right to redraw administrative boundaries. They did their best to increase or uh, include chunks from a number of other uh, provinces into what they conceive to be Tigray as one unique region in Ethiopia. 
The mistake they made was when they began redrawing international boundaries. That's where they were trapped, and that's what we call the quagmire. Now they can't get out of that uh, quagmire, they can't extricate themselves out of the cut. They will have to find an explanation for this act of violation. First question, I, I elaborated to go at length because it's very, very important to make, uh, to note this. What we see now as its secessionist aspirations did not come now. They have been there from the very beginning. In fact, in the very beginning, uh, as I said in the TPLF manifesto, they make it clear that uh, our national oppression is such that we can never live alongside the oppressive nationality that they call the Amhara. Uh, and so uh, our objective is to establish uh, an independent Republic of Tigray. Uh, as they declared in that uh, manifesto of 1976. Uh, and from then, of course, uh, they faced severe criticism from Eritrea, from the EPLF, uh, from other uh, Ethiopian organizations, uh, movements of uh, progressive democratic movements. And so as soon as they faced this backlash, they withdrew that uh, manifesto uh, and this, by the way, uh, the former members such as uh, Dr. Aragawi Berhe, who was part of the leadership, has uh, clearly uh, exposed this in, in recent interviews. And other Ethiopian groups also uh, talked about this. Dr. Aragawi, how do you get this to the ከድርጅቱ አመራሮች ጋር ነው ወይስ ከድርጅቱ ጋራ ምክንያቱም አንድ ጥያቄ ለጠይቆ ተፈልጋለሁ የዶክተር አረጋይ በርሄ ቅራኔ ወይንም ግጭት ከድርጅቱ ህዋት ከሚባለው ድርጅት ጋር ነው ወይስ ህዋት ውስጥ ካሉ አመራሮች ጋር ነው ምክንያቱም ድርጅቱን ከፈጠሩት መካከል አንዱ ሶ ነው የርሶ የጭንቅላት ውጤት ነው ህዋት ድርጅቱ one year after the founding of the organization those from the leadership who advocated for the secessionist agenda got together and wrote the TPLF's manifesto of 1976. Once we were aware about this, we confronted them and put a stop to it. Though we revoked the manifesto, that didn't mean we erased it from the minds of those who sought secession. This secessionist agenda letter reared its ugly head when TPLF leaders captured state power in 1991 and inserted the secessionist agenda in Ethiopia's 1995 constitution. They called it federalism, but it was a sham ethnic federalism imposed from above. That's not real federalism, which should come up from below. <laughs> Federalism is a federalism. 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 But this is the background in 1975-76 uh, from which we, we start. Great, thank you, Elias. So actually you touched on uh, my next uh, two questions. So with the 1976 manifesto, you mentioned, you know, their aspirations for the greater Tigray. And so my next questions are, uh, at least at the beginning, did they have a, a clear political uh, ideology or a clear political agenda? Did they have that? And my next question is, um, from the beginning, from their inception, were they a nationalistic movement? So those are my two questions. And uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh a nationalist in the sense, are you talking about pan-Ethiopian nationalist yeah. nationalism? Yeah, pan-Ethiopian. Pan uh, no, that only 
that only came later after they faced the backlash. Initially, they were an ethno-nationalist uh, group focused on separatism or secession from, from Ethiopia. This was clearly articulated in the TPLF manifesto. But later, uh, they tried to adjust uh, their objectives to one of uh, forming democrat a democratic Ethiopia in which all uh, nationalities would live side by side in equality. And uh, they also articulated their willingness to cooperate with other uh, uh, ethno-nationalist uh, opposition groups or multi-ethnic uh, members. But uh, this was only in, in, in political rhetoric. In reality, uh, as soon as the group that I, that I mentioned earlier, the EPRP established base in the Asimba mountains of uh, northern Tigray, the Erob area, uh, they could not tolerate it because according to the TPLF, this is Tigrayan territory. And they looked at the EPRP as, uh, you know, as, as an extension of uh, Amhara domination. Although the EPRP itself was a multi-ethnic movement, it had uh, combatants from all ethnicities, Tigrayans, Amharas, Romos, and, and uh, other uh, ethnic groups. There were even some Eritreans that were struggling alongside the EPRP. The TPLF, however, could not tolerate uh, any competition <laughs> inside what they consider Tigrayan territory. And so uh, they, they, uh, they, they repeatedly urged the, the EPRP to move out of, of Tigrayan territory. Relationships reached such a uh, acrimonious uh, position that the EPLF had to intervene and bring both the TPLF and the EPRP uh, to Eritrea to try to mediate and uh, reconcile their differences. This was uh, done at a meeting in 1976, in the early part uh, of 1976. Uh, and it, the EPLF tried to reason with both sides uh, that both sides could work out their differences and form a united front against the Dirk. Uh, alongside the EPLF. Um, well, uh, this attempt by the EPLF to reconcile the difference between the two groups did not work out. Eventually, uh, the TPLF, in fact, from this uh, uh, attempt at, at mediation and reconciliation by the EPLF, was uh, angered and said, though we our stand is clear on the Eritrean issue that we support the Eritrean people's struggle for, for independence. The EPLF is trying to be neutral and, uh, you know, siding with the EPRP as they saw it. So in uh, a sort of childish uh, temper tantrum, they broke off relationship with the EPLF and went to, to establish relationship with the Eritrean Liberation Front, the other uh, Eritrean uh, group that, uh, that was at that time uh, also struggling inside Eritrea. But again, uh, this was an opportunistic move by, by the TPLF and it didn't even last a year because pretty soon with the ELF, they, they, they started to clash on border issues. Uh, the ELF at that time also was collecting taxes from Eritreans inside Tigray, uh, which the TPLF did not like. Uh, the TPLF's ambition, as I said, in Badme and other uh, territories that are clearly Eritrean led to uh, uh, an armed clash with the ELF, the Eritrean Liberation Front, that Eventually, they were pushed back from, from the border areas, uh, and the TPLF then uh, uh, came back to re-establish ties with the EPLF. 
uh, at the same time, it launched also an armed attack on the EPRP in Asimba by the end of 1976 and the beginning of 1977. And it cleared them off Asimba, uh, cleared the EPRP of Asimba. So relationships, uh, again, were reestablished with the EPLF. Uh, so this showed the opportunistic nature of the TPLF from the beginning. It soon also began uh, an armed clash with another group of uh, opposition movement called the EDU, Ethiopian Democratic Union, led by the former governor of Tigray, Ras Mengesha Siyum. Uh, the EDU clearly was a right movement. Uh, so it considered the TPLF as a socialist uh, left movement. Uh, initially, the EDU was much stronger than, than the TPLF. But in repeated clashes, uh, eventually the TPLF emerged as the dominant uh, group. It crushed the, the EDU and cleared it of uh, Tigray. But this this took a while. I mean, the, I think the EDU was there until 1979 or thereabouts, until the first Congress of, of the TPLF, in which they formally adopt the name TPLF, Tigrayan People's uh, Liberation Front. But uh, during this period, uh, as I said, it, uh, it moderated its secessionist stance and instead of the establishment of uh, the independent Republic of Tigray, they uh, modified it to be the general uh, self-determination of the people of Tigray. And uh, by that time, of course, by 1979, uh, relationships were warmer with the EPLF. It received more training, more... Uh, arms uh, from the EPLF and so uh, joint operations were also held inside Tigray uh, and uh, you know uh, uh, various several rounds of uh, new recruits were sent to Sahel uh, to be trained by the EPLF uh, and we come to the period of 1981, for example, in which, uh, you know, about 2,000 new recruits of, uh, of, the, of the TPLF were trained uh, in, in Sahel. Uh, and by the time they finished their training, we come to the period of 1982, the big offensive of the Derg, the military regime. Uh, against Eritrea, uh, it's called the Red Star Offensive, the sixth offensive as it's known in Eritrea. And so the TPLF, of course, realizing that once the Derg, if the Derg would crush the, the EPLF inside Eritrea, it would be dangerous to its own existence. So they send a contingent of uh, uh, thousands of, of their uh, combatants to fight alongside the TPLF. And this is the biggest uh, uh, military operation of the TPLF alongside mm -hmm. the EPLF inside Eritrea. Yeah, that's a really good uh, point, Mr. Elias. But before we go uh, to how the Red Star or the, the, the timing between uh, the time when they created the manif manifesto, what was their uh, thoughts in creating uh, this manifesto? What, what came uh, to make them want to create this manifesto? Like, uh, was, it, was there any specific reasons during these times for them to create a specific manifesto to go or look through it and pass by? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. The motivations is what you're asking for. What, what, what motivated them to come up with uh, this Greater Tigray Manifesto? Yes. Well, uh, there's a very good article 
or paper written by the great Eritrean writer, researcher, historian, Alam Seged Tesfai, uh, in his article was written in 1999, the, the March of Folly Reenacted. Uh, he recounts of uh, the leadership of the TPLF that came to visit liberated Eritrea under the EPLF in 1979. And they held their uh, uh, talk of, to the EPLF fighters in which he himself, Alam Seged, was present. He recounts this vividly and he says that throughout their long lecture, they constantly talked about how uh, the Tigrayans were oppressed nationality, uh, they were looked down uh, by the Amharas, the dominant uh, ruling uh, class uh, in Ethiopia, but in general they call the Amharas, uh, how they were looked down even in Eritrea, uh, that uh, their objective was to rectify this. Uh, he says, we were astounded, we were puzzled by this, because throughout this long talk, they never talked about their, what is their political program, how do they see uh, bringing about change in Ethiopia? What kind of future do they envision for Ethiopia? What kind of relationship do they have with other opposition movements inside Ethiopia? So none of this was uh, dealt with in their, in their long talk, he said. They had on the psychological dimension how, uh, you know, they were. Uh, they were mistreated in Ethiopia, looked down upon, and the objective is to rectify this situation. So the March of Folly reenacted a personal view by Alem Sagatasfai, published in the journal Eritrean Studies Review, Volume 3, Number 2, 1999. My own personal experience with the Wayana leadership came in 1979 when two of their leaders visited the base areas of the EPLF and made a speaking tour. I attended one of these and heard the speaker lament and condemn the indignities and insults suffered by the people of Tigray. He even ran down the list of degrading nicknames that other peoples, including by the way, Eritreans attached to them. All that he said was to be put right. I remember distinctly leaving the meeting puzzled by the speech. He discussed neither ideology, which we had all expected, nor Ethiopian nationalism, which would have been natural. There was no doubt, we all concluded, that the TPLF's loyalty was to Tigray, not Ethiopia as a whole. The thing that worried us most, however, was the reasons he listed as grounds for their struggle. The question was whether an armed organization whose leaders think they are looked down upon, belittled, and ignored by all around them can ever feel rectified. Ours was a war of independence, pure and simple. We wanted the enemy out of our country. Theirs, we felt had a frightening psychological aspect. Satisfaction for them could only come, we agreed, if they rose above the common run from which elevated status they could, quote, do unto others as had been done unto them, end of quote, danger there somewhere. So this, kind of, this psychological dimension was there from the beginning in this narrow click of young uh, petty bourgeois students, most, most of them, uh, that this inferiority complex was always there. And so in their view, in their uh, perspective, the struggle was to rectify this, uh, these grievances that, that they they perceived grievances of being looked down upon by the Amharas, looked down by the Eritreans, uh, 
uh, that, uh, you know, to bring back the ancient glory of Tigray, according to them, Tigray had, had, had been the, the, you know, the, the beginning of the civilization. And so uh, the vision of great, greater Tigray, this expansionist uh, idea of establishing an independent republic, the, the root cause of it was more psychological than political. Because if you, if you look at the political analysis, uh, the Tigrayans were not the only oppressed ethnic group inside the big uh, empire uh, of Ethiopia. Ethiopia is composed of more than 80 ethnic groups, uh, nations, nationalities, uh, and uh, Tigray, uh, in fact, the oppression of other groups in, in the Ethiopian Empire was more than that faced by, by the Tigrayans. The Tigrayans were uh, not as oppressed, for example, they, they have their the, the language, uh, the language of Tigrinya was not as such suppressed in Tigray. It was the choice of the Tigrayan ruling classes. Their choice was to speak in Amharic or uh, to make the, the official language Amharic. You know, it was not imposed on them as such, uh, as it was in Eritrea, for example. In Eritrea, in the 1950s, during the Federation period, Tigrinya and Amharic and, uh, excuse me, Arabic were the official languages. But at a certain point in the 1950s, these official languages of the Eritrean government were suppressed and Amharic was imposed as, as a language of instruction in Eritrean schools, as a language of communication in Eritrea. Uh, there was no such thing in Tigray as such. And the ruling feudal classes of uh, Tigray were also working hand in glove with the so quote unquote the ruling Amhara groups. And, uh, you know, they, they were as much beneficiaries uh, and there was no serfdom in Tigray as, as there was, for example, in southern Ethiopia, in Oromia. Uh, and so uh, it, is more, it was more of a psychological condition of this group, uh, how much the, the, the psychological mm, grievances uh, affect the, the, the political outcome, I leave it to more qualified psychologists to make a study. But it was always there, these uh, grievances of being looked down upon, uh, and it was a driving motivational force in the TPLF, the issuance of the TPLF manifesto, and throughout in, uh, in, in the struggle in, 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 in Tigray in the TPLF's uh, arena, it, it had uh, a large influence in, in decision making and in, you know, in what later became they imposed in Ethiopia as the ethnic federalism after they captured state power in 1991. I hope I have addressed your, your question if, uh, if I understood it correctly. Right. Thank you. Um, so you touched on this uh, a little bit, but I want you to expand on this. So as you said, uh, the EPLF ha uh, had trained um, the TPLF since its inception in 1975. And in 1976, uh, they came in with this manifesto that doesn't even um, give acknowledgement to the uh, sovereign land of Eritrea or that doesn't respect the sovereignty of Eritrea. Yet the EPLF chose uh, to, to make um, uh, alliance with the TPLF. And as you know, in 1978, with the strategic retreat uh, of the EPLF, it was a very tough time uh, to the EPLF. Uh, so why, why all this? Why, did, why was the... Uh, EPLF in alliance with the TPLF, despite all their action, their negative actions uh, towards uh, the struggle. 
that would be my first question. My uh, follow-up question would be, there are some people that will um, draw equivalency on the uh, military and political capabilities of EPLF and TPLF. Uh, do you think this is a fair assessment that EPLF and TPLF were equivalent on their military and political uh, capabilities? Very good questions. Uh, first one, uh, you mentioned the strategic withdrawal. Uh, so we have to clarify this to our viewers. What is it? The strategic withdrawal in 1978 was forced uh, upon us by circumstances beyond our control upon the Eritrean revolution. In 1978, the then Soviet Union, USSR, decided to intervene on the side of the Ethiopian derg, the military junta. The derg in Amharic means junta in, in Spanish, huh? military junta. So, uh, if you remember at that time, the Soviet Union was first uh, supportive of Somalia. Uh, and Ethiopia under Haile Selassie was being supported by the United States. It was a client state of the United States up to 1974, 75, the downfall of the emperor. But once the, the Derg uh, uh, launched the coup d'etat and the Emperor Haisulazi's regime fell, uh, increasingly the, the Derg regime began to shift uh, left war. I mean, it, it declared socialism. Of course, at first it was a, a, a right nationalist group that only uh, advocated for Ethiopia first, Ethiopia take them. But eventually, when uh, left movements such as the Meison joined it, it uh, shifted to the left. And uh, the Soviet Union allied with, with, with Ethiopia. And there was, of course, the war uh, on the Ogaden uh, between Somalia and Ethiopia. Here in this war, there was massive intervention of the Soviets, the Cubans, the South Yemenis on, on the side of the dirt, which uh, tipped the balance and the dirt won that war. Once it, uh, it settled the score on the Eastern Front, on, on the Somali Front, then it turned its back towards Eritrea and uh, this massive arming by the, by the Soviets tipped the balance, the military balance in favor of the Dirk. And in the face of this overwhelming uh, force, the EPLF decided to make a strategic withdrawal to retreat to its mountain stronghold to abandon, I mean, to, 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 to leave the liberated areas in, in the highlands of Eritrea, all the cities and towns that it had captured from the dirt, it decided that the, the circumstances were not in its favor. The balance of force was tipped to in favor of the enemy. And so as it retreated, it tried to, of course, weaken uh, the dirt, uh, Eventually, it retreated to its mountain stronghold of the north, this, what is known as the Sahel area. So that is the strategic withdrawal. Uh, it was a brilliant uh, military uh, decision, military and political decision, the strategic withdrawal, because in the mountains of Sahel then, the EPLF preserved its force, and in long protracted struggle, uh, from the beginning, as it announced, as, uh, as the EPLF announced it in, in its uh, statements, eventually, in long protracted struggle, the military balance would tip in our favor and we will enter uh, into a stalemate and from stalemate we will take the, the offensive. And that is what happened from 1978 up to 1988 in eight successive offensives, the EPLF weakened the Dirk's uh, military and eventually it captured, it seized the upper hand and took the offensive, which uh, eventually 
brought about the independence of Eritrea. So this is about the strategic uh, withdrawal that we need to clarify to viewers what, what, it, what it was. So uh, your question then, was it uh, one of tactical alliance with, uh, with the TPLF? Yeah. Knowing, so, knowing that the TPLF's <laughs> greater Tigray Bab had annexed large chunks of Eritrean territory, even uh, sea, sea coast of Eritrea. Exactly. Why did the EPLF uh, choose to maintain relationship? Yeah. yeah. But, uh, was it tactical? Well, the EPLF's view was that this nascent group. Uh, will eventually outgrow this immature, politically immature perspective, infantile perspective. And in the long uh, process of joint work, will we'll reach, uh, will outgrow this immature perspective and will we'll eventually realize uh, the, the, the greater uh, strategic objective of defeating the Derg and bringing about, bringing about democratic change inside Ethiopia. This is what the EPLF had hoped for. Uh, it entered into relationship, even nurtured it, even uh, went beyond that and uh, continued to arm, to train and arm the, the TPLF forces. Because one, the EPLF understood that it needed the cooperation of Ethiopian opposition movements, not only the Tigrans, but the Oromos, the other multi-ethnic uh, opposition movements against the Derg. So forming a, a united front against the Derg was uh, of vital strategic importance uh, for the EPLF. It understood that this is going to be a very protracted, long struggle and uh, to win the war against the tyrannical Derg regime, it needed the cooperation and uh, common front with the other Ethiopian opposition movements. So uh, forming an alliance, uh, a joint uh, united front with, with the TPLF was part and parcel of that. This is, by the way, clearly enunciated in the EPLF's position paper that it published in 1985, formally. But informally, this outlook of the EPLF towards uh, Ethiopian opposition movements was there since its first Congress's political program of 1977. If you examine the political program of 1977 of the EPLF, you will see this vision of the EPLF clearly articulated. But it was formally uh, articulated in that 1985 position paper of the EPLF. Its title was Integrinya his Baugambarin Zindinata to Miss Democracy Awyan Mintis Asat Ethiopia. In English, uh, it is title was the EPLF and its relationship with democratic opposition forces of Ethiopia. This paper, by the way, was published in the review of African political economy. So viewers can easily Google search uh, and find it and, and access it and read it. It's, it's a well-written, well-articulated position paper. The EPLF and its relations with democratic movement in Ethiopia, first published in Adulis, a monthly publication of EPLF Volume 1, Number 11, 1985, subsequently republished in the Journal Review of African Political Economy, Number 35, May 1986. <laughs> Hadas Ertra, Mubel is Rancho Mountain, I met Kuzaroba Antilten, Asser the Chat at the Kim Tortation Asser Mountain. Minchi, work our mates at his welcome bar, fits a meta, Asser Hamster Lecat at Shench at the meeting summer and Hamster. The Eritrean People's Liberation Front 
has come forward to give its forthright views on the basic questions and tasks of the Ethiopian revolution because it is convinced that the destiny of the Eritrean and Ethiopian people is closely linked. The Front believes that for the advance of the Eritrean revolution, cooperation with the struggle of the Ethiopian peoples comes second only to the capability of the Eritrean people and that for the Ethiopian revolution, the most important external factor is the Eritrean people's struggle. It works carefully, patiently, and seriously to broaden and deepen its relations with the democratic Ethiopian organizations and reinforce the solidarity of the two peoples. The EPLF puts the importance of the formation of a solid alliance between the two revolutions above any of its diplomatic activities. At the same time, it expects from Ethiopia's democratic movements of similar stand and equal sense of responsibility. Essentially, it says that it looks at the relationship with Ethiopian opposition movements, including the TPLF, in strategic terms, not in tactical uh, opportunistic terms. Huh? Uh, the EPLF believes that uh, in order to bring about change in Ethiopia, a democratic change, and the, the defeat of the dirt, all Ethiopian opposition movements, be they ethno-national uh, movements or multi-ethnic democratic movements, have to cooperate on a, on a united front formed against uh, the dirt, in which bringing about a democratic popular government in Ethiopia would be a cornerstone. So it must not be an opportunistic one, but based on bringing about democratic change in Ethiopia. Uh, it has also, it needs to address, of course, the national oppression question in Ethiopia. Uh, on the, uh, on the Eritrean issue, of course, the right of the Eritrean to self-determination uh, must be accepted. Uh, also, uh, you know, an anti-imperialist position must be there. Uh, you know, you, we, we cannot allow in this united front a right-wing opposition groups that advocate for uh, you know uh, pro west or pro imperialist uh, position and so uh, this was clearly articulated in that in that position paper so uh, to answer your question then it was not tactical but a strategic uh, view that uh, the EPLF had in its relationship with the TPLF and its arming and training of the TPLF and other forces, even uh, such as the Oromo Liberation Front, uh, initially the EPRP, and later the Ethiopian People's Democratic Movement, uh, which uh, later entered into alliance with the TPLF and formed the EPRDF, was also uh, based on this uh, strategic view. Uh, your second question was, yeah, my second question was, um, there are, you know, some people that will try to draw equivalency on the uh, political and military mm -hmm. capabilities of the uh, EPLF and TPLF. And also that goes with uh, uh, hand in hand with this. Uh, you mentioned how the six, uh, six offensive of the Dirk or the red um, um, offense, the red, red star, star offense, offensive. right? Yeah. Um, some people try to portray it as if uh, the TPLF helped EPLF uh, into surviving the sixth offensive. Um, but uh, can you can you expand on that? You know, is this a true uh, a historical uh, statement like that? TPLF helped the EPLF survive the sixth offensive. <laughs> okay, uh, let's take them point by point as to the equivalency between TPLF and EPLF. Uh, well, by the time the TPLF started its uh, 
you know, its nascent, uh, its inception or its embryo in 1975. It was a very small and inexperienced uh, group, opposition group. Huh? Ambitious, grandiose ideas were there, of course, very mature, as, as we saw in its TPLF manifesto of 1976. But by that time, the EPLF was an uh, extremely mature national liberation movement. It had gone through the experience of the 1960s. Bear in mind that the Eritrean Liberation Front was started in 1961. So by 1975, the EPLF had an accumulated experience of 15 years almost, or 14 years of armed struggle. Its leadership uh, came from various backgrounds, from students, from workers, from the diaspora, uh, intellectuals, uh, some of its leaders were in the late 60s trained in China, for example, Isaiah Safurki, Ramadan, Muhammad Noor, and uh, a few others in 1967 were sent to, to China to be trained there. Other contingent was also sent to Cuba around that time, Ibrahim Afa and others. Uh, and it had the, the Eritrean struggle had also passed a bitter experience of sectarianism within the ELF. Uh, and so that was a, a school of, of struggle from which the EPLF had emerged. So the radical correctionist movement of progressives that later became the EPLF in 1970 emerged from that background. So it, so it was. Uh, well experienced in terms of uh, combat, guerrilla warfare, training. Uh, some of its contingencies were also trained in Syria and, uh, uh, and you know, students from University of Khartoum had joined the struggle from University of Asmara, University of uh, Addis Ababa, from the West also some who were almost... Uh, uh, were Russia, doing their... Russia, Cuba, Iraq, right? Yeah, there were students, for Eritrean students who were trained in Soviet Union, uh, in European universities, in American universities. So by 1975, the EPLF was a very mature, progressive group which had uh, battle hardened uh, leadership, experience, and uh, also political maturity in terms of dealing with world leaders, uh, diplomatic savvy, uh, and what have you. It's uh, skills in terms of uh, propaganda, in terms of PR, media relationship, uh, was incomparable. Uh, so uh, the TPLF was a student in this period. Uh, how much did they benefit from this relationship, from the mentorship of the EPLF, the nurturing? Well, uh, from the TPLF side, it was an opportunistic uh, relationship. Huh? Uh, you can see that in various periods when they, uh, when they felt that they were strong enough, they would uh, condemn the TPLF, uh, the EPLF as non-progressive, non-democratic, bourgeois type of uh, uh, organization. Uh, sometimes they would swing to the extreme left, uh, we, which we will see later, the Marxist-Leninist uh, League of Tigray. Uh, so, uh, an extremely uh, opportunistic, shallow, uh, and inexperienced uh, group. Uh, but always uh, it has this chameleon-like nature in which at times that it felt weak, it would seek EPLF's uh, uh, support and alliance. At times that it felt it was strong, it would also uh, break off relationship and try to form uh, other relationship with other uh, rival Eritrean groups. So it, it was, this approach was more tactical. Huh? on the TPLF side. The view of the EPLF, as I said, was that uh, uh, in the common struggle, eventually this petty bourgeois uh, narrow clique would mature. And as, of course, uh, more 
peasants joined the struggle and uh, in the joint struggle and training inside Eritrea, this mature view would eventually emerge uh, and that uh, it's, uh, it's beginning of uh, this uh, grand uh, greater Tigray vision would eventually, it would shed this, uh, this, this uh, narrow, narrow vision and outgrow it to become, to emerge as a democratic movement. This was the hope from the EPLF side. Uh, events, his history proved that the EPLF's uh, perspective was more mature and eventually that was what won the, the day and brought about the demise of the Derg and uh, uh, 1991, the, the victory, the historic victory of both the Eritrean and the Ethiopian peoples. Mm. So uh, this is how, how we can look at it. But to prove this, I think uh, viewers must read that, uh, that position paper of the EPLF, uh, which was published in 1985. We will put a link to that in the, in the comments section so that uh, 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 viewers can, can understand these points I'm trying to, to elaborate. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, before we go into uh, the second part of our interview, you know, uh, post 1982-1983, the relationship between EPLF and TPLF. Uh, uh, just briefly, I want you to mention um, uh, the relationship or the military relationship that was happening back in the Sixth Offensive uh, of the Dirk against the uh, um, EPLF. Uh, so yeah. as I said, some people mentioned that um, uh, TPLF had greatly contributed to the survival of EPLF during the Sixes Offensive. Was it, um, did it, uh, did TPLF really helped uh, in the survival of EPLF or was it TPLF was shielded under uh, EPLF during that time? So uh, if you can say something briefly. Mm -hmm. First of all, we, would not want to deny the, the sacrifice of uh, fighters of the TPLF who fell in the mountains of Sahel along the trench defending against its onslaught, the sixth offensive. Uh, the danger of the sixth offensive, uh, which was dubbed as the Red Star Offensive by the Derg, uh, was, uh, was great. It was obvious for all. Huh? The, the Derg had uh, declared this offensive to military crush the EPLF once and for all. And in its view, once it crushes the EPLF, all other uh, insurgencies inside Ethiopia would also be wiped out. This danger was also clear for, to the TPLF. They mm. said the Derg amassed a huge army in a, in a, in a period of uh, one year of training and preparation, uh, amassed huge armaments from, from the Soviets and the East Germans, the, the Eastern Socialist camp, what have you. Uh, and in the, the, the balance between the EPLF, which its combatants at that time, uh, troop strengths was estimated around 20,000. Most credible historians uh, estimated as such, and I, I have read in publications of the EPLF also that that was uh, the total strength of the EPLF. By that time, of course, the ELF was uh, cleared, uh, pushed uh, from the Eritrean field uh, in 1981. Uh, the TPLF's force was uh, much uh, lower than that. Its battle experience was uh, incomparable when you compare it to the TPLF. But they realized that if the EPLF was defeated in this six offensive, the Red Star offensive, that, were, that was also uh, dangerous for them. And so, uh, one, in order to receive experience, 
they sent a contingency, a uh, couple of brigades uh, to, to Eritrea. Already in 1981, about 2,000 were being trained the end of 1981 in Sahel under the, the EPLF. So uh, together with this, uh, they, you know, they, they fought along, alongside the EPLF in this, in this historic, uh, decisive uh, military uh, engagement, offensive. Uh, yes, they, were, they paid the sacrifices, uh, but they gained also uh, huge, this was a, a learning experience, a, a battle experience for, for their uh, new recruits that hitherto have not had uh, war experience. So uh, the Eritrean side appreciates this uh, this uh, this help or this this uh, fighting alongside the Eritreans, and this is not the first time the the EPLF also had previously fought inside Tigray alongside TPLF. Uh, later, also in the battles of Shire in 1989 and the final battle to reach to Addis Ababa, the, the the EPLF's help was uh, crucial. Yeah, uh, we, 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 we will deal with that in, in, in subsequent parts. But to answer your question, yes, they did help. Was it decisive uh, or not? Uh, well, uh, it was a significant help. Uh, I mean, uh, you have to remember that this, the battle lines were uh, along uh, hundreds of kilometers of trenches. Huh? So in the trench warfare, of conventional warfare, uh, the TPLF forces were inexperienced. At first, in fact, in the sixth offensive, uh, the TPLF had their own commands. The enemy, the Ethiopian military, realizing these weak points, started to attack and penetrate through this. And later, they decided to, to you know, uh, uh, dismantle this uh, this uh, this contingent and spread them out within the, the EPLF uh, forces, mix them up. Huh? Uh, one in order to get experience. Two also the the command of the the the, the, the front line would be under the more experienced and battle hardened uh, Eritrean uh, military commanders. Uh, and uh, it minimized the risk also of uh, weak points along which the enemy could penetrate the, the, the front line. Uh, uh, and so by the end of uh, 1982, the, the sixth offensive was foiled. The Dergs, uh, you know, declared objectives were not met, um, and the Dirk faced a huge uh, loss, both in terms of uh, human as well as armament. The, the EPLF side uh, captured uh, strategic weaponry tanks in this engagement of the sixth offensive and came out stronger. And Soon after that, the Dirk decided to launch the seventh offensive, which was dubbed as the silent offensive. Why was it dubbed silent offensive? Because the Dirk decided not to declare it openly. But this was as bloody and as dangerous as the sixth offensive, if not more so. Some, some EPLF fighters consider the seventh offensive even more dangerous. But in this servants offensive, the, the, EPLF, the TPLF decided to withdraw and not continue to fight alongside the EPLF. Why? Even though the, the danger was as, as significant as the sixth offensive, uh, the TPLF's excuse was that it had uh, a political conference of its combatants, so they took uh, all their combatants from the front lines and withdrew to Tigray. It was only towards the end of Seventh Offensive that they sent a few contingents uh, forces. Uh, why did they do that? Well, 
some regional neighboring countries, security intelligence uh, uh, organizations, some say from Sudan and Saudi Arabia, had promised the TPLF that they would give them significant uh, assistance if they split off from the EPLF or if they withdrew from their forces from the EPLF. Uh, the objectives of these neighboring countries being they were uh, they felt more threatened from the EPLF, the radical EPLF emerging stronger and victorious from this encounter. So they wanted to create a counterbalance to the EPLF. And so the TPLF in an opportunistic move uh, withdrew its forces uh, at a time when the EPLF uh, was facing grave danger, but the EPLF uh, proved resilient in the seventh offensive of 1983 and emerged even stronger. Uh, so these are the kinds of uh, opportunistic and tactical uh, maneuvers of the TPLF throughout the long period of relationship, uh, as we will see uh, later in part two in the in the second part, also, the, the, the relationship reached a very low point and the TPLF decided to break off relationship completely. Great. Yeah, uh, that's uh, our next point, actually, uh, our next question. Um, how is the relationship between EPLF and TPLF post-1983, uh, up until 1988, and how would you describe that relationship? Well, again, that's, uh, it will require for us to do another part. Uh, hopefully, in the second part, we will deal with this exhaustively. From 84 to 88 is one period where the relationships were completely uh, at a standstill at their lowest point. And then 1988, when the, uh, the victory of the EPLF in, in the NATO front uh, came, this was a huge uh, blow to both the Derg, the Ethiopian military junta, and a, a wake-up call to the TPLF, realizing its fatal mistake uh, and, uh, you know, seeking renewed uh, relationship. We, we can look at this in, in the second part at length. Uh, but for now, I hope our viewers have, uh, have a clear uh, understanding of the ups and downs of the relationship between the EPLF and TPLF and how the EPLF uh, tried to handle the TPLF in a mature way, uh, hoping that uh, the relationship would grow step by step into a strategic, more mature kind of relationship. Uh, uh, but by 19, end of 1983, beginning of 1984, that relationship uh, soured and uh, reached a standstill. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Comrade El Asamara. And uh, we'll see you on part two. Look forward to that.